just entered the theater of an alien sky. If the words and images seem strange to you, there's a reason for this. Our world was once a vastly different place. To experience this won't hurt you, and there is nothing to fear. When exploring ancient myths and symbols, the first rule is to follow recurrent themes back to their earliest occurrence. That means as close as possible to the original provocation in the natural world. At the dawn of the great civilizations, what natural events occurred with such impact on humanity as to produce an explosion of storytelling, obsessive reenactments, and monumental construction? Uncovering that catalyst becomes essential and there's no other way to make sense of the vast human response in ancient times. The greatest challenge the researcher will face is the confusion of surface detail. There were far too many cultural interpretations and elaborations, too many self-promoting cultural claims, all leading to fragmentation of the archetypes. By localizing the stories, the ancient chroniclers could only introduce a flood of regional contradictions as every culture asserted its own special place in the stories told. A good example of this fragmentation occurs with the historical emergence and evolution of the archetypal primeval city, the mythical homeland affirmed by so many cultures the world over. We introduced that theme in our previous segment on the Atlantis myth, a story with a hundred claimed origins in different parts of the world. Though no one disputes the primeval city archetype, the critical question is too frequently missed. Why the persistent connection of the sacred city to the story of creation and its subsequent catastrophic destruction? In fact, it's this very connection that confirms a global archetype beneath the surface confusion of localized variations. We see the paradox in the creation myths of ancient Egypt, for example, where certain foundational concepts persisted for thousands of years. Every sacred city in Egypt identified itself with the celestial world created in the beginning. But what did that mean? Despite their diversity, the regional myths converge on a special place, a land said to have emerged from an undifferentiated prior condition in the creation. That primordial environment meant no visible stars, no sun or moon, just a diffuse glow most often reported as all-encompassing waters of chaos. Always remember that the condition so often translated as chaos did not convey any modern sense of agitation or something out of control. The literal meaning was the absence of any discernible activity and any discernible form. Egyptian priests repeatedly declared that in the Zep Tepe, the first occasion, or first time, the island of beginnings arose from the celestial waters. And all Egyptian traditions agree that it was this remembered creation that gave to humanity a model for sacred construction on earth. In fact, every temple and every city identified itself with a prototype it was in the Zeptepi that the wandering creator Autumn found his resting place. And from that place the drama of creation began with the triangular or pyramidal form of the Ben Ben stone at the center and summit of the sky. From the first appearance of Autumn as the Ben Ben, the work of creation progressively unfolded with the emergence of the island of creation. It was through this collective memory that ancient kingship rites could name the creator himself as the exemplary ancestor, the first in the line of kings. I came into being of myself in the midst of the primeval waters, the God states in the Book of the Dead, or the God declares I was alone in the primeval waters. Or again, I had no companion when my name came into existence. 
By following this theme to its roots, we can see the critical distinction between the ancient symbol and the celestial referent symbolized. The original act or object was cosmic, while the symbol was its commemorative expression locally. The irony is that by virtue of the inherited symbolism, every sacred land or sacred place proclaimed itself to be the original location. By this identification, the Creator could be said to have stood on the very spot of the local temple or city. You can see this in the titles of cult centers from Heliopolis to Memphis, from Hermopolis to Edfu, or Thebes. Each celebrated its own special identity with creation, leading to multiple variants of a single underlying memory, as in this declaration of the coffin text. The great God lives, fixed in the middle of the sky, dweller in the city. The cosmic city is the primeval place symbolically duplicated throughout Egypt. I have come to this city, the region of the first time, to be a dweller in the land, the texts say. Thus, the Egyptians invoke a celestial Memphis, the divine emerging primeval island, a celestial Thebes, the island emerging in noon, the cosmic waters, which first came into being, a celestial Hermonthus, the high ground, which grew out of noon, a celestial Elephantine, called the city in the midst of the waters, and a celestial Abydos the Ta'ur, the primeval great land, rising from the same cosmic waters. So too, Chinese tradition declared the local kingdom to be a copy of the celestial empire, and each capital city imitated the same plan. The integrated symbolism, even when growing complex, never departs from the underlying idea of a visible place or land, the first form of the created world, emerging from a primeval ocean. Of course, as we've seen so many times, the localization of an archetype invariably introduced regional contradictions, even as the archetypal substructure persisted across the millennia. The ancient memory of a lost island preserved around the world consistently harked back to a prior age, an age of innocence and wonder. For the Greeks, this was the age of the first sovereign Kronos, whom the Romans knew as their own ancient ruler, Saturn. Here are the words of the Latin poet Dionysius of Halicarnassus. Haste to the realms of Saturn, shape your course where Cotelet's famed island wandering floats. The cross-cultural accord is remarkable. Japanese legends recall the ancient cradle of life as a floating island called the Drifting Land, congealing out of the primeval waters. Its original location was said to be the North Pole, later localized to become Japan. That's the localization of the cosmic archetype. So too, the legendary floating island of Delos, which Poseidon stabilized by his cosmic trident. Pointing to the same archetype would be the floating islands of the Argonautica, called the Strophades, or Islands of Turning. In the voyages of the Celtic divine hero Melduin, the adventurer encounters a fabulous isle in the midst of the sea. Around the island was a fiery rampart, and it was ever wont to turn around and about it. Examples are plentiful, all reinforcing our most fundamental claim that every archetype stands as a contradiction of our natural world, the primeval revolving islands of Rhodes, or Kasaira, spun on the cosmic spindle, the primeval isle of the Cyclos, the wheel, which gave its name to the Cyclades, the white island of Zeus in the midst of the sea, the floating Hindu white island Shweta Dwipa, located at the axial center of the sky, the lost Toltec white island of Tula, also called the center of the world. That is the fundamental quality of the Sumerian Eker, the pure land or great land, always venerated as the model or prototype. And we see the same exemplary role in the Assyrian Asara, the supreme place founded by the gods, remarkably similar to the pure land of the Buddhists. 
Rather than familiar geography, the terminology always takes us back to the place of mythic origins, subsequently localized through commemorative practices. The greatest mistake a researcher could make is to confuse the original inspiration or first form with its local symbol. No mythic archetype has ever been explained by a local experience. But with that reminder, it's also worth noting that the historical localization of universal traditions by bringing the gods down to earth was the primary means by which humanity consecrated and passed on the archetypes across the millennia. And that is why in our comparative study we are invariably led to the universal substructure of storytelling the world over. In the process we observe how through localization of an inherited story every tribe and every nation asserted its own identity as the children of the Creator Himself. What then is this connection telling us? As we've repeatedly observed, it was intensely remembered events that gave each culture its sense of divine origin, its mythic connection to the gods. And it's this connection that requires us to follow localized mythology back to the archetype of creation itself. The truth is that a single archaic idea could never confirm a cause in human experience. But the existence of just one archetype does pose the question of cause. And how will we address that question as we encounter hundreds of archetypes, all connected to each other in an underlying agreement of the ancient cultures?